You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. Australians have served as peacekeepers since 1947. The very first were military observers to a UN operation in what's now Indonesia. Since then, defence personnel, police officers and civilians have been deployed on different missions around the world. They've monitored ceasefires, cleared landmines, treated casualties and distributed humanitarian aid, often in difficult and dangerous circumstances. So this is where we have our display about Somalia and the Australian operations there. And the key part of our display is these toy guns intermingled with real guns that were collected by Australians while in, deployed in Baidoa in Somalia during our period with UNITAF. David Sutton is an historian and curator working on the development of the peacekeeping and humanitarian galleries. He's showing me a glass display case filled with genuine and mock weapons that at first glance are hard to tell apart. We have quite an interesting array of toy guns on display here, including this one in the bottom corner, which looks remarkably like an AK-47. So the way it's been made is with kind of bits of wood and there's actually screws and old bolts to make the, the muzzle. And there's an, a door locker or a, a gate lock, which has been used to recreate the locking mechanism of the gun. It looks like a bolt. It really does, yeah. And I guess if you're going to be playing with the toy, it has that kind of click action, which someone m might find a bit satisfying. But I guess the difficult thing is that it actually, at first glance, does look enough like the real thing to really fool you. What about this one in the top left-hand corner, the silver, well, it looks, looks like a pistol. Yeah, so this is the smallest toy we have. It does look like a pistol. It's actually made from uh, like a, a spray gun or something you might use to, to load up and put sealant in your shower with. And the th same trigger that you might use to push that sealant around is the, the trigger on this toy pistol. And these are only a couple of the guns the memorial has in its collection. Who made them? I think there's around 20 in our collection and obviously these are only a fraction of the, the large number that were collected and then later destroyed by Australians in Somalia. They were made by either people in order to sell as toys to children or perhaps by children themselves and they were also made by bandits who couldn't get their hands on the real deal. They would actually use these toy or, or mock weapons because they knew that in, in the darkness of night if you're just trying to intimidate some rivals if you wave around something that looks enough like the real thing then it, I guess it's job done. So the soldiers who took them from Somalia weren't just taking them because they were a novelty, because they were interesting souvenirs, they were actually confiscated. Yeah, Australians uh, did a lot of confiscating weapons in Somalia, and that's a bit of a point of difference to the Americans who operated in that same area before us. The whole point of the operation of UNITAF in Somalia was to facilitate humanitarian aid. The Americans in Baidoa before us interpreted that as showing up and putting the food out and then moving on and whatever happened to it after that was what might happen. The Australians took a different understanding and they actually more actively tried to confiscate weapons and this began with just taking any weapons they saw but unfortunately that also meant sometimes taking weapons that people needed for protection, people who weren't actually necessarily up to no good. Later on we started registering weapons and changed our tactics a little bit but we were still confiscating loads of weapons from bandits and, and you know militias who were creating so much trouble in the country. Because in this glass display cabinet we can also see weapons from real weapons from all around the world. Yeah we deliberately display the toy net weapons next to the real weapons to, to show how similar they look and, and how um, but also how eclectic the mix is. And yes, we have weapons from all around the world. We have weapons from, from Hungary, we have weapons from Germany, we have weapons from Egypt based on a Swedish model. We even have a, a Lee Enfield 303 rifle, which was made in 1944, 
probably used in the Second World War, and now it's been sawn off and made its way to Somalia and now to the Australian War Memorial. So what were Australian forces doing in Somalia? In 1960, the East African country had won independence from its British and Italian colonisers. David says it was set up as a Western-style democracy, but traditional clan rivalry and complex politics made that difficult to achieve. The Somali people were subjected to a brutal military dictatorship, followed by war with Ethiopia, then a civil war. By the early 1990s, Somalia was a failed state. There was complete anarchy. There was a famine in which hundreds of thousands of people died. The international community, through NGOs and through UN aid agencies, was bringing in a lot of aid and food, but it was having a lot of trouble getting to the right people. Quite often it might have been stolen by bandits and then sold on the black market. So the international community, first through the UN, in the United Nations operation in Somalia, or UNISOM, came in, but it never really had the power to really help protect and stop the violence. And then in 1992, a much larger operation called UNITAF, Unified Task Force, which was US-led, came in. Australia contributed a battalion group to that, based around one RAR, roughly a 1,000 troops, which was operating in Baidoa. And they were there to help facilitate, give that humanitarian aid, and provide some security to the area. How long were the Australians in Somalia? The UNITAF operation, or Operation Solace, they were actually only there for about 17 weeks. But Australians were there for much longer. They, um, from 1992 right through to 1995, there were smaller numbers with UNISOM. So at the same time as the UN operation, there's the US-led, UN-sponsored UNITAF operation. So there's a small Australian movement control unit and air traffic controllers based in Mogadishu, living in really difficult situations. And, yeah, an amazing job given how difficult and complex the task was. Tell us more about what conditions were like and the sort of day-to-day work the soldiers were undertaking. For the Australians serving in Baidoa as part of UNITAF, they were living in tents, which um, often they had to leave the sides up because it was over 40 degrees, and yet this brought in dust and scorpions and spiders and really difficult to get sleep and rest, really awful conditions. In fact, some of the only rest they might get is when they were allowed to go and leave to HMAS Tobruk, which was off the coast, where they might you know, be able to have a shower and a hot meal. A lot of the time for many of the troops was um, spent doing these patrols around Baidoa and these are really tense patrols, really long. Again, they're carrying all their flak and webbing. They don't know, they've turned around a corner whether they're going to be goaded by local youths or, or bandits or who, and they were firefights and the extreme exhaustion uh, really took a toll on a lot of the troops and, and explained some of the unauthorised discharges which happened during that operation where basically through sheer exhaustion uh, safeties on guns weren't put on and, and some of them were fired. Were there any Australian casualties? Uh, There was one Australian death, Lance Corporal Shannon McCallany, on the 2nd of April 1993. Uh, Before they were going out on patrol, um, someone in his team handed him his gun as he was going to get his bush pack. Uh, Unfortunately, that gun discharged and and hit McCallany, and he he died later of his wounds. Um, There were also Australian casualties in some of the firefights with bandits. Private Chris Day was shot through the shoulder, um, and there were a lot of close calls with um, bullets whizzing through bits of equipment and and, um, grenades being thrown towards the Australians but bouncing into a ditch happily um, and therefore not causing any, any casualties on that occasion. It's probably fair to say that most Australians don't remember the Australian contribution in Somalia back in 1993. Why do you think it was important and why should we remember it? It is really important that Australia undertook operations such as that in Somalia for a number of reasons. First of all, there's two main reasons why we get involved in peacekeeping operations in seemingly far-flung parts of the world. The first is a humanitarian element. It's the right thing to do. Hundreds of thousands of people of people were dying in Somalia and Australia has the money and the resources to help out and was one of many countries that did so. There's also a strategic element. Um, when you look at the kind of the papers leading back to the discussions in, in Canberra about why we might go, um, there's often people talking about this idea of us being a good international citizen. So we go on these operations to be seen in the UN and with uh, other allied powers to be doing the right thing and being an active player in world affairs. It's also, I suppose, despite being so difficult, an amazing experience for Australian soldiers to be in a place like Somalia doing that kind of work. I could pretty safely say that I wouldn't have thought many of the uh, the Australians who served in Somalia ever thought they'd find themselves there. There is an element of getting great experience on these operations. For many of them, it was their first deployment um, and it was our largest deployment since Vietnam. So. 
there, there are lots of reasons for Australia to be involved and it's, it's a part of our history which is largely forgotten and this is true of quite often of many peacekeeping operations from Solomon Islands, Bougainville, Somalia, Rwanda. They're really poorly understood and um, I think we could do better to make sure that people ha do have a greater understanding of that. Sean Robinson was an Australian Army Corporal who served with UNITAF. In this 2019 oral history, he talks about the day in March 1993 when artist George Gittos photographed him cradling a tiny Somali child. The photo hangs on a wall in Sean's home. I think, I think we were down near, um, yeah, we were at Barakaba at that time. And it wasn't long after we, uh, the battalion went down and secured that area. And we were doing inoculations. And at the time, uh, we turned up, we set it all up, ready to go, and then that's when the elders started negotiating whether or not they'd uh, be able to go ahead with the inoculations because they wanted certain things and so on. And Anyway, it, it was just one of those days. As, uh, I just got asked to come over and help hold the kids to while they were given the needles, which I end up doing and... Um, George Giddos ended up getting a couple of photos there and that's how that came about. But uh, it, was a, it was a hard day really because there was like, the, the child in the photo, you know, they're that young and they're looking at you like, oh my God, who's this person? But, you know, you see the condition of some of the kids, it's, you know, that, that's probably the hardest piece for me. Um, yeah, that's about pretty much it all talk about that. <laughs> in the years leading up to the peacekeeping operation, an estimated 350,000 Somalis had perished from disease, starvation or violence. Hundreds of thousands more have died in conflicts and famine since then. I asked David Sutton what he thinks about when he looks at the toy guns on display at the memorial. I think it speaks of a society in trouble. The fact that children are making or playing with these toys that are often made from sometimes real gun parts, which they've just found in the streets, it talks of that generational violence that the kids are growing up in a place where the people they want to emulate, the people they want to be, are these bandits, these warlords, these militiamen around them. And it's such a big part of their life that they're choosing to do this. And I know that you know children play with toy guns everywhere, including Australia, but they were so common in the country at the time. They were made from those real bits of guns, which just shows, you know, how common it was to find weaponry around. Uh, it, it just shows the anarchy of Somalia in that time to which Australia deployed. You're listening to Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Maher. We're listening to a song called Mnao Bumakau, which is from a, a cassette album of songs called Songs for Peace by Australian diplomat and folk singer Fred Smith. And he created the cassette in uh, 1999 when he was a peace monitor on Bougainville. And this song, Mnao Bumakau, in pidgin means, yes indeed, cow. Um, now, bull Macau. Um, now, bull Macau. Um, now, bull Macau. Margaret Farmer is senior curator of honour rolls, official and private records. She's also a big fan of this song and the role it played in the Australian peacekeeping mission on Bougainville. We're listening to it at the Memorial's Art Annex in the Canberra industrial suburb of Mitchell. Fred was on Bougainville as a peace monitor, as part of the peace monitoring 
group. And that was New Zealanders, Australians, Fijians and Ni Vanuatu who had been invited onto Bougainville to create the conditions of peace for the Bougainvillean people who'd been at an an intense civil war for the best part of 10 years. We'll come back to the cow song and the work of the peacekeepers in just a minute. But first, the war. It had multiple causes, including Bougainville's claim to independence from Papua New Guinea. But central to the conflict was the Panguna copper mine, which operated from 1972 until it was forced to shut down 17 years later. So the Panguna mine was developed by the Papua New Guinean government in cooperation and partnership with an Australian mining company. They had negotiated rights to mine the land with men, but on Bougainville, land is actually owned by women and passes through the matrilineal line. So they had not actually acquired the permission to develop the mine on that land. Another tension that came from it was the actual disruption to the land itself. Open pit mining is very dramatic. It really looks like you're gouging the land and that is what you are doing. The tailings from the mine were polluting the river, causing sickness and ill health. And as a, another aspect, the profits from the mine were going to the Papua New Guinean government and to the Australian company rather than to the local people. So it became an uh, enormous source of tension. And in fact, it's due to protests about that mine that really were an enormous part of the causes of the Bougainville conflict. Margaret's brought me to the art annex to show me a huge work of art which is dedicated to the so-called blood generation, children born during the Civil War. And here's the third. So this is a triptych called Sammy and Panguna Mine by the artist Toloi Havini and working with Stuart Miller, who's a photographer. These are large-scale photographic works that show the Panguna mine on Bougainville. That mine closed in 1989 and the mine has been disused from that time and the vegetation is growing back into this large open pit mine. And then you can see hulking, rusting machinery and a figure of a young woman very beautiful Bougainvillean woman who is wrapped in white drapery. And in the three photographs, uh, she's in different positions. Here, she is standing dwarfed by the enormous machinery. And you can see the bucket of the digger is almost twice the height of her body. And And looks as though it's about to scoop her up. It does, doesn't it? And she is standing in defiance, exactly where her mother and aunties stood with their babies strapped to their backs in protest at the Panguna mine. Margaret, what do you so love about these three Mm. photographic portraits, I suppose you'd say? Yeah, they're profoundly beautiful for a start. You can see the beauty of the land even as it's scarred and you can see the dignity and the strength of Sammy and through her of her foremothers as she uh, sits and stands asserting her and their ownership of the, the landscape. And they're very, very particular to the conflict on Bougainville For me, I also appreciate the powerful way they speak to conflict more generally in terms of conflict arising out of our need for resources, our relationship for land, disputes over resources and misunderstandings around culture or perhaps willful ignorance of culture, of other people's culture and affirmation or entitlement of our own needs as opposed to somebody else's needs. Unarmed peacekeepers arrived on Bougainville after the 1997 ceasefire. First, the Truce Monitoring Group, led by New Zealand, 
then the Australian-led Peace Monitoring Group, comprised of defence personnel and civilians. So the fighting had stopped by then, but it was still an extremely violent uh, an extremely tense environment, I should say. There was the prospect at any time that violence could break out. And the role of the peace monitors was constantly to encourage the conditions for peace, constantly uh, inform around the progress with the peace process, bring people together, create confidence. They encouraged singing and music and also playing of sport as a way of bringing people together. They held endless community meetings and supported leaders, particularly female leaders, who were powerful leaders in the process for peace. When Fred was there, he tells the story of how he'd taken his guitar and he was uh, sitting out one day on the steps of a building with pretty much the only light globe above him uh, in town and he was strumming his guitar and he looked around and there were about 200 Bougainvillian children. I found myself sort of inventing this song that went and the kids would sing along and go like now and they'd all cry out bull macau which means cow which doesn't mean anything in particular except that they had cows on bougainville but they became extinct during the conflict so cows were like this mythical figure anyway the song kind of caught on when the piece of the songs of peace cassette was distributed and it got to a point where you know, peace monitors could drive through a village and call out the window, M now! And the kids would cry out, Bull Macau! And it became a kind of point of connection, a point of silliness. And he found that, as other peace monitors did, that if the children were responding to you and you seemed friendly to the children, then other Bougainvillians would come and start speaking to you. I mean, these were people who'd lived under the most dire conditions of civil war, of starvation and uh, lack of medical attention and profound conditions of distrust and really living by their weapons for security for 10 years. And so to find a way to establish rapport and trust was very important. And as it turns out, culture and sport became these vehicles to establish trust. So was the cassette recorded on Bougainville? Were any local people yes. part of the recording? Were they there as musicians, yes. for example? Yes, exactly. So it was recorded on Bougainville in 1999. Fred had learnt Pigeon by playing music with local musicians and when they had had the idea for this, the MIST, which is a mission information support team, flew over a, a recording deck from Australia to Bougainville and Fred was talking to local friends about this and they said, well, you must talk to this particular man who had worked at a recording studio in Port Moresby called Pacific Gold in the 90s in the early 90s and this was a, a very big deal. So he, he invited this man to join with him and he had read all about digital recording technology but he'd never used it but he worked it all out and there were also uh, local musicians who played and sang with him as well. What do you so love about this song in particular of all the songs on the cassette? Mm. I appreciate the silliness that Fred refers to and the role that that played, but also I find it profoundly personally affecting to think that cows became extinct on Bougainville. Nobody who was on Bougainville at the time who ate any of those cows would not have been aware of the longer-term impacts of them becoming extinct. And it, it says so much about the conditions that they were living in 60,000 people out of a population of 160,000 were displaced. It's thought 20,000 of that population perished, and only 1,000 of those are thought to have died from direct violence, and the others died from starvation, malnutrition, and lack of medical attention. Let's join hands together. 
We walk side by side. Together we walk the path to peace for Bog and me. Peace on my island. Peace for our people. Peace in our souls. Peace in our hearts. Peace in our hearts. Peace in our hearts. Thanks for listening to this episode of Collected, stories from the Australian War Memorial. I'm Louise Ma. You can subscribe to the series by going to the Memorial's website or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.